Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Inc., New York's window company, Capital One Bank, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding for this program is made possible by grants from AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Beechwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, F.J. Siami Construction, Friedman LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors LLC, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Markham LLP, Marcus and Millichap Real Estate Investment Services, Meridian Capital Group, The Moynian Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling Inc., Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, The Wickoff Group. Hello, my name is Michael Stoller. Um, welcome to Building New York. There are, there are investment sales in New York. New York City is, is, is a place where office buildings, residential buildings, land, everything is sold. And the, and the leading place in the world with sales of investment properties take place are in New York, New York City, the, the area. And today I'm very fortunate to have a man who's been involved with investment sales for his entire career who, with his uh, partner and his wife, Dawn, run the largest uh, investment sales company in the country with one single office, uh, the chairman and CEO of Eastern Consolidated, Peter Hopsberg. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So, you know, you were talking, because I think it's, it's interesting, and, you know, I have to talk a little bit about your dad and yourself. Uh, y your father um, went to Brooklyn Tech, and he became an engineer, and then he was working for this power company? American and Electric Power. American Electric Power. And you were, and you were born? Born in Fort Lee. But in Hackensack. You were born in Hackensack, Hackensack Hospital, but you were yeah. born in Fort Lee. And then you grew up in Rye. Ameronic first, yeah. and then when Dad got a raise, he built the house. We moved across the line to Rye. Now, the, the interesting thing is Dad was, you know, with the power company, and then he went to work for the small little company called Consolidated Edison as a VP engineer, right? Yeah, the uh, utility, uh, the city's utility got in, in trouble in the 70s, started to break down. It was basically run by lawyers, and they knew they had to hire a bright engineer to come in here and actually fix the stuff. And, you, and your dad, as I said prior to the show, was, you know, then became the president, then became chairman of the board. Right. And was responsible, and, you know, besides Brooklyn Tech, he uh, he was in the air in the military in the navy in the navy and uh, Columbia University. Yeah, Col he had an engineering master's by eight, age eighteen. He was on the fast track. Now, good good tutelage, but his son didn't want to become an engineer. Now he grew up in Westchester, and then <clears throat> after high school, you decided to go to uh, Duke. Right. How come? I wanted to change to go down south and uh, had heard a lot about Duke and uh, the weather is not to be underestimated. When it's 60 degrees in January, it's a great I mean, thing. a great sports school. I mean, you know, I have sons who went to Michigan, so you know, there was always a little problem with the people in North Carolina. Not at Duke. the time, though. We had the basketball team and the football team were near the bottom of the scale. It changed uh, somewhat later. Now, when, when you were at Duke uh, during the summers, what, what were you doing? Uh, various odd jobs of uh, bartending, uh, uh, waiter, stock clerk, whatever I could get uh, down in Durham or more up here in, uh, in Rye. 
So after where you were at Duke, you decided to, you want to become an attorney? No, it was uh, 75 at the time. 75 was a lot like it is now. We were in a you know great economic recession. There was a high unemployment, and there just weren't a lot of jobs around. I, I think I got one job offered uh, from Exxon to work in a cubicle in Houston, and wasn't so interesting. So I did what most people did, which is either you go to law school, business school, or medical school, and you sort of kick the can down the road. And so I chose coming back to New York to go to law school, and it was turned out to be Fordham. Truly in New York, you went to Fordham Law, and Fordham Law and, uh, in the Lincoln Center campus. Right, and then did not enjoy it for the most part. But uh, right. well, We were talking prior to the show, I mean, some of your summer jobs between law school didn't seem to be appropriate for that. No, I uh, you know, did a stint as a police officer for the Westchester County Police when they hired a, 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 a policeman for the four months the parks were open and they'd give you two weeks of training, a 38 in a uniform and they'd turn you loose in Playland. Biggest problem generally was the kids from the city would beat up the Scarsdale kids and take their tickets. And then I uh, did a stint as a cruise uh, taking single groups of singles on the cruise ships to the Bahamas and Bermuda. So I put off law as long as I possibly could. Now what about, um, weren't you uh, one of the country clubs also? Oh yeah, I was a lifeguard at uh, Old Oaks Country Club in Purchase. So you graduate law school. It's what, 1978. 78. You're what, 25? Yeah, just about. 25. 24. And and your job. What, what do you? What's the first job you get? Well, I interviewed with probably 40 or 50 law firms and did not get in, despite having great grades at Duke and Fordham and boards and everything. And I, I was sort of devastated by it. Later on, I realized it was real proof that God existed because I was the only one who didn't know I shouldn't be a lawyer. So I did get a job with North, Northwest Industries, a big conglomerate doing tax and trademark work, but uh, they didn't test for ADD back then, which I later figured out I was and couldn't really spend three or four hours on a brief. And so I quickly tired of the Northwest Industry job, but uh, then I had a friend of mine who decided to skip law, went, went to law school with me, but he decided to skip the law firm route and go right into a commercial real estate company where they gave him a $200 a week draw, the blue book of Manhattan with the owners and a telephone and they said, you're off. And I think my first uh, year I made 19000 and he made fifty, and then I got a raise to twenty one, and he made one fifty. And then when he was coming in at $500,000 a year back in 1979 to 80, I said, Mom and Dad, do you mind if I become a real estate broker? And uh, they had helped me with my law school education, but they were absolutely fine with it, and they probably knew as well as anybody else that I shouldn't have been a lawyer. So how do you find your job? I mean, you're a lawyer. You really didn't want to be a lawyer. So how do you find that first job in, in real estate? Well, uh, this friend of mine, uh, as I said, was having a great time making unbelievable money. And then uh, because I didn't have any money, when we would go out at night, I'd usually make dinner in the apartment. And then we'd, then we'd go out. And one night he came in with his new colleague from the real estate company. And it was this gorgeous, dark-haired, flashing-eyed beauty. From Sarah and, Lawrence, right? From Sarah Lawrence. And uh, she was already a top deal maker in real estate. And on top of that, her name was Dawn Paris, if you can believe it. So when I saw him come in with this package and I heard what he was making, I said, I want to go there. So I called up the owner of that firm and I said, I want an interview. And I got my $200 a week draw, a telephone, and uh, the Blue Book of Manhattan and started making calls. Now, what was interesting, you were telling me the, the firm was really the uh, like the growing place, you know, the, uh, the bullpen or the minor leagues for some of the major people who got into real estate later on. Yeah, his... this firm had uh, was with Brett Nolan, a top firm th at the time, and it had about 100 residential brokers, and among them were Elizabeth Stribling, who of course went on to uh, uh, make a terrific company, Barbara Fox, who runs a terrific operation. And then uh, the owner started a commercial division, which was for commercial properties, and that's where my friend went, where Dawn was, and had about about 10 people in it. Now, everybody remembers their, their first investment sale, the first deal. What was yours? I canvassed up uh, a guy named Larry Devine, who was a local professional, still is actually, and he owned a building at 154 West 18th Street, 12-story, 80,000-foot loft, and uh, some of the tenants uh, were just giving him uh, a hard time. They wouldn't buy out before their lease expirations, and he threw up his hands, and when I called him, he said, yeah, I'd sell for this number, and... Uh, 
at that time, uh, you know, you got, I got excited because I had somebody who wanted to, wanted to sell their building but wondered how anybody was going to come up with the five odd million dollars that uh, would take to buy it. And then I realized uh, that there are hundreds of guys around with five, ten, or fifty million dollars to spend, but very few buildings. So the art of it became how to find that deal before anybody else did and, uh, and get it placed. So you got it placed. We got it placed with a Swiss investor who did convert it. So now you're you're at the the firm. How do you how do you and Dawn, who at this time was your girlfriend, who eventually was going to be your wife, as you said to me, you even spoke to your parents. You said, "I'm going to marry this woman." Uh, how do you decide to go out on your own? Well, we we made a couple of deals by our uh, you know while we were at that firm, and then we started not to get paid after closing because they ran into cash flow issues. So it was tough enough to make a deal, let alone not get paid after it closes. So we sold uh, some investors a building at 11 East 44th Street back in 1980. It was the first office building in New York to be sold for over a hundred dollars a foot. Believe that was it or to not, the, uh, to the Chartouni brothers. Uh, and uh, we took some office space as part of the deal at 11 East 44 and then just started collecting some good people who generally were good salesmen but in different industries. Now, how do you, how do you decide the name Eastern Consolidated? Well, at the time we were small and we wanted to try to look large and we decided Eastern Consolidated Properties would make us look like a larger operation. And by the time, many years later, we realized that that was way too big a mouthful. We were branded and stuck with it. Hey, Eastern Consolidated, is, 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 it's a good name, you can't. Now, we were talking, so besides 11, the, the property on 44th Street, what was the, some of those interesting early deals? Because I, I have to talk about your, your two other endeavors when you were young before you got married to Dawn. Yeah, sure. Before, before we get to that. So wh which were the we, deals that you, you were doing really well and making some money, you said to me? Yeah, we did. Dawn and I did a, another deal at the uh, Lowell Hotel, which at 2080-63, which at the time was sort of a flea bag, but occupied by an interesting group of people who, with no rent stabilization status uh, that we could determine, some uh, countesses from Austria, the actress Ali McGraw, some interesting people. And the Chartoonies approached it uh, very delicately and uh, were managed to vacate the property. And of course, it's now probably one of the city's premier hotels. So now you're there, you've made some money, and all of a sudden, I realize you were a lawyer, you decide you're going to get into the limo business? Well, again, I had, a, I had a good friend of mine who was a marketing partner, and uh, at you know, 27 years old, you do know everything in the world. And so we thought this would be a great tax shelter as well as a money maker and also a fun thing to do. So we ordered 15 new stretch limousines, and at the time they were the first ones in New York with redwood bars and, and TVs and video players. and. Uh, they were terrific cars, and at the time, Studio 54 was getting really, really hot, and our cars being the best were taken by a lot of high-profile people who would line them outside a studio and, uh, and keep them all night. And it was very interesting business because uh, it, the partition that goes up between the driver and the back of the limo actually doesn't do anything. So the stories that would come back from the drivers were, were pretty amazing. Now, we won't say, fortunately, you got out of that business. Uh, because that business, you know, it was a good tax shelter, but, you know, you were 27, you learned it wasn't the business. Then you, then you tried your luck in the, uh, the Broadway productions. Yeah, my partner friend, uh, the marketing guy, had another friend who wrote the uh, book for both 42nd Street and Barnum, which, of course, were tremendous hits. And he wrote a third uh, book for the stage, and that was The Three Musketeers. And since we had this personal connection with him, he offered us the opportunity to produce his third play, which we jumped at, optioned it for a little bit of money. Then we start, started uh, holding backers auditions, which essentially were a couple of actors who would do a skit from the show, a lot of liquor, some good-looking waitresses, and about halfway through the process, we realized between the limousine company and this, we were this was not for us. So we actually sold the play for $25,000 or so to the person who had produced 42nd Street in Barnum, and she did raise the $4 million necessary to put on uh, Three Musketeers, and on opening night, D'Artagnan came down the center aisle on a white horse, went up on stage, and after the reviews came in, the play closed after one night. Thank you. 
Everything is uh, timing in business. I it, should have realized when I read the book two times and didn't really like it, that maybe it wasn't a good idea, but what the heck. So now it's time to get back in, into the business. And, and you know, you have done some interesting transactions that we were talking about. And I think one that's very interesting is perhaps the assemblage at 1177 Avenue the Americas, which became America's Towers, which happens to be now owned by Larry Silverstein and the California Pension Plan. Let's talk about that. Yeah, we were working for some guys, uh, you might remember Joe and Ralph Bernstein, who at the time were called the New York Land Company. And Joe and Ralph decided they wanted to put together a site to build a big office tower. And Don and I started canvassing around the city to see if we could find uh, a piece of dirt for these guys. And we started, we called Seymour Durst uh, at 1177, who had some properties in the block that is now 1177 Avenue of the Americas. And Seymour was very heavy in land at the time. And uh, we made a deal with him and then we had to assemble the rest of the block. And Seymour was very helpful because he went way back with the property owners. And he, without him, we never would have assembled the full block. And uh, it, did, uh, it did finally finish. Joe and Ralph put up 1177 with Kumagai Gumi. There was that huge fight we all remember, but uh, Joe and Ralph came out I of mean, that. it's a million square foot building. It's uh, exactly. really uh, a great tower. And then not too far away, you've been involved with the Durst organization in the assemblage of uh, One Bryan Park. Yeah, while we were doing 1177, all of a sudden a parcel came up uh, at the, in the 42nd and 6th northwest corner where One Bryan Park is now, and it was owned by a Canadian, Bob Campo, if you recall. And the four buildings were priced at $11 million, which was high at the time. And uh, Joe and Ralph decided they would buy those parcels because they were interested in getting involved in 42nd Street. But since Seymour was so helpful to us on 1177, they offered it to Seymour at cost, at $11 million. Not a markup, not a flip or anything. Seymour said thank you, but again, he was heavy in land and he turned that deal down, which I'm sure dismayed Douglas many years later but it led to an involvement on that block that went for 17 years until we finally put the last piece of the puzzle together. Yeah, but in that interim period, you were also involved with the financing of... We did the refinancing of uh, four times square for $400 million, which at the time was the largest uh, office building refinancing in New York City. And we also did with the Durst's uh, the block between 57th, 58th, 11th, and 12th, which was a 99-year lease with the... Which uh, is presently the property called the, the Helena. Helena. Right. And where they're going to be building up a second so, building. So there was no rhyme or reason to it, but we've played a big role in the Durst's uh, major transactions, which has been... Uh, but you've also, you know, you, you've also been involved with the Loeb family and some of their properties, the Soros's uh, on that. And then you were, we were talking about differences in values of how properties change. Uh, 150 East 58th Street. I think that's a, an interesting story. Yeah, right? that's the architect and designers building, that big 600,000 foot tower up near Bloomingdale's. And there was, since everything was done off market in uh, New York at the time, a couple of uh, Iranian guys in London had the contract and they uh, flipped their contract to uh, AEW, who brought in uh, New York State, State Teachers Retirement Fund for 80 million and Equitable gave them an $80 million first. So they bought this at 250 a foot, $160 million at the peak of the market, roughly, I think, about 87 and 88. And then, of course, came uh, the recession of the 90s. The architects and the designers that populated that building went out of business. Nobody could fill it. By the time 93 came along, we sold the building for $60 million with 10 cash to uh, Michael and George Carfunkel, a couple of guys from Brooklyn who have a, had big non-real estate operations. And so the entire equity of $80 million was wiped out for the New York State teachers, and Equitable itself lost 20 and had to take paper to get rid of the deal. Now, you, we were saying that also, because now we, you know, we had the, uh, the nightmare of 2000 and the end of 2008 and 2009 in the real estate business, 2010 is getting better, but People call me Dr. Doom and Gloom, so I'm not <laughs> sure about that. But in the mid-90s, you were involved with this very interesting auction, you told me, at, at the Waldorf Astoria, where a thousand people came. Yeah, we, uh, you know, we, we tried to, you tried every way you could to get a deal done back in the 90s, and we decided that uh, to try this auction along with Howard Michaels of Carlton, uh, and we assembled sellers of all sorts of real estate, actually all over the country. We had gas stations in Texas and and cats and dogs that filled a 
four inch thick book and we held the auction in one day, went for eight hours in the Starlight Room of the Waldorf Astoria. We had a thousand people. It was the largest auction I have ever held in New York for properties. We uh, found, uh, found out for the first time that with these auctions, a lot of the deals are made after the auction, not at the auction, and that's actually what happened then. But it was quite a scene for eight hours. Now, when we were talking, you said one of the people who have been really influential in your growth in the business was Stephen Green of S.O. Green. Yeah, Steve, Dad was my mentor in life, but Steve was my real estate mentor, and I'm sort of the big brother I never had, and he really taught me everything you needed to know about how so, to... So let's talk about those deals, because Steve had, at that time, S.O. Green, Steve has an interesting life, which I, I one day would like to interview, uh, but Steve was the B buildings, you know, and, and that's what you were also. A lot of B buildings over the over the time. Let's discuss that. Yeah, Steve and I did a lot together. We did, you know, things like 4, 468, 470 Park Avenue South, 250 Park South, 50 West 17, 32 West 18. All of these were 80 to 250,000 foot buildings, which sort of formed the bedrock of Steve's B building portfolio, which of course he then, you know, turbocharged, took public, and changed into more of an A, a owner. Now, in addition, you've had some other interesting buildings, some other hotels, right? That you find? Uh, some had. small ones here and there, you know, that were part but, of assemblages generally. Now, some of your other notable buildings at the uh, investment sales that you've done? Oh, well, 685 Third Avenue is a building, the American Home Products, that yeah, was just sold too. vacant now. Well, we, uh, back in the early 90s, uh, the chairman of American Home Products that fully occupied the building decided he would move his entire workforce out to where he lived near in Summit, New Jersey. And this, again, was an off-market deal, no agent, but we discovered the plans to do so. And we brought in uh, Lucadia and made a very quick deal for $50 million for that 600,000 feet, which was $80 a foot which again now is in contract, I understand, for it was so, uh, also empty, but for 300 or something, right? Right, to, uh, 285 a foot. Hey, it's pricing. I mean, we were talking about this, you know, with you a couple of months ago, you know, when, when land prices went up to $450 a foot. You know, some of those prices aren't there. Now, you've, all, you, you've also been in the residential development, haven't you, in Harlem? Yeah, we've uh, well, we've done a lot. As brokers, done a lot of multifamily deals up there. But Dawn and I also uh, applied to uh, be eligible for the New York City's third-party transfer building, which actually would give buildings to uh, two own responsible owners if, um, that were pretty decrepit, and we'd get a loan from HPD for three percent and fix the buildings up, retenant it at very low rents. Uh, but you have it also included a 34-year tax abatement. So we did a number of those acquisitions uptown, which we still have. Now, another thing that's interesting that you and Dawn, um, and I think it's giving back to the community, is uh, a number of years ago you gave something to the Westchester Land. Westchester Land Trust? Yes. Uh, we did when we bought our first property up in, uh, not first, but a property up in Bedford, we did have two extra building lots on it, and it was a spectacular uh, uh, property. Uh, we just sold to Barry Gazin, actually, but uh, we didn't want to see anyone build two more houses on it, so we put two conservation easements on it after learning about the program, and then uh, I got on the board. I'm still the vice chairman of the, the trust. It's a great organization that keeps things green in Westchester. Now, you and Dawn have been also involved in a number of charitable endeavors. Dawn's the on the board of the Northern Westchester Hospital, has been for a long time, instrumental in uh, building a new uh, cancer treatment center and an emergency room that's being built right now. And you're involved also with the Jewish? I'm on the board of the Jewish Child Care Association, which was founded in 1822, one of the founding members of the UJA, and we take care of, we're pretty much the last safety net for 1,300 kids in New York City. And Non-sectarian also. Uh, yeah, actually, you know, it was formed, of course, to uh, take care of Jewish orphans in 1822, but of course the um, it soon morphed into uh, the population now is about 95 percent black and Latino, but uh, their mission is absolutely spectacular. And we're proud you, to be part of it. You know, you were saying at the early part of the onset of the show, I mean, you have about 60 people, 70 people today? Yeah, about 60. 60 people, and you have, uh, you know, all of them come from different backgrounds, and that's what makes Eastern a little different. Yeah, we speak nine languages in the office, which pretty much reflects the investment makeup of the New York City five borough 
uh, roster of investors between the Chinese, the Iranians, uh, uh, and the other nationalities. We, we cover pretty much all of them with uh, 35 brokers. Now, you have how many children? Two, uh, right? Two. And they are? Uh, Philip is 24, and he's an actor in New York. Actually, has started getting some work, which is fantastic to see. And uh, daughter Ale our daughter, Alexandra, just graduated from Duke and just got a, a job uh, with a small company that's making novelties for little girls. So do, would you like, do you think the kids would ever want to join this business? Uh, Philip did an internship there for a summer, and he said after that, he said, Mom, Dad, you can have it. Let me out of here, which was just fine. Now, the, the idea is, you know, you, look, you never really thought you'd be in this business. I mean... It's a hidden business. They don't teach it in school. They don't tell you about it. Everyone I know seems to get into it accidentally or because they know somebody like you or a colleague. Right, but the, the interesting thing is, look, if, you, if you're looking at it this way, you know, you, you, you fail to say that you're also on the board of the M&T Bank uh, Real Estate Committee and, you know, the other involvement... This is a business, the real estate business. You know, you, you've seen the change of the city. You know, we have a picture over here of the city, and, and you're able to gain insight. It's a business that hard work, tenacity, truly tenacity, uh, and to have the desire that, you know, I'm not going to pay you. I mean, there are pe I mean, you don't pay your people. No, right? we haven't paid anybody for 10 years. And, and But there's the desire and the growth. And how many principals do you have right now? There's 13, of which most of them have been there over 15 years. Great group. We have a lot of fun together. It's a very horizontal organization, and we all do better because of spending time together, exchanging thoughts and information. So if you had to sum up your life, you know, your parents, you think, would have been happy at this, uh, that, that you're in this business? I think so. They only wanted us to be happy, uh, and uh, they were terrific parents. They were not critical of anything. They were there with their support the whole way along. Uh, so I, I think that uh, what you and Dawn have done with Easton Consolidated has truly been a building of New York, and I'd like to thank you for being here today. Thank you, Michael. Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Inc., New York's Window Company, Capital One Bank, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding for this program is made possible by grants from AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Beechwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, F.J. Siami Construction, Friedman LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors LLC, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Markham LLP, Marcus and Millichap Real Estate Investment Services, Meridian Capital Group, The Moynian Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling Inc., Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, The Wickoff Group. Thank <laughs> you.